Hey everybody, your favorite professor here literally just wrote that, pretty cool. Uh, today we're going to talk about middle old adulthood. This is that period, that transition from when you become a quote unquote adult to older adult. I love this meme here because it really highlights this life course perspective we are taking in this class. Because you can't have a midlife crisis if your whole life is a crisis. <laughs> Before we start, I want to give a shout out to Charles Wade of Boonesboro, Maryland. Uh, I guess one of the unintended consequences of being able to do these courses on the internet, on the internet, <laughs> that's what the kids say, is that the reach of the materials that I have is, is goes further, right? So it's gotten to the East Coast. So uh, thank you, Charles Wade, for watching these videos, and I hope you continue to enjoy them. Part of what we're going to elaborate on is whether becoming old is a state of mind or are these a biological processes? As you see here with this meme that you're only as old as you feel. So bigger grand question we are asking today is at what point does one become quote unquote old? And this other meme, I, I've just, I guess this week I love memes, that you're, you know you're old when you pay more for the candles than you pay for the cake. I, it's kind of silly, it's like a dad joke. Speaking of dad jokes, I guess you're old when you have a dad bod. So that's, that's another meme we have here. And this elaborates what we've been discussing this whole semester about what does it mean, right? What do these labels mean, young, old, and older adult, and how do they relate to the whole aging process? The agenda today will be to overview the experiences and these issues with transitioning from adulthood to older adulthood. And we're going to go through the theories on mid to old uh, adulthood, then we'll talk about one of the major issues today about the sandwich generation and the midlife crises, and we'll get into that a little more, along with research on potential interventions of, the mid, of midlife, along with just general experiences in midlife, such as the changing roles, uh, biological processes, and general adjustments associated with transitioning from adulthood to older adulthood. What we're trying to do in this course is to provide this life course perspective to aging because we know once aging is not just a product of when you're an older adult, it's a product of your whole life course, right? The things that happened prior to you. And the perspective we are taking is through this dash, right? We, we understand that that it's not just about the end of life, but it's the beginning, the earlier periods of life too that relate to the aging process. So starting with this dash, this is how we set up this whole course, right? We want to end up there eventually in emerging adulthood, right? where most of you are, but we started with death, right? These issues of dying, you know, what do you want to be known for? What are the issues related to the dying process? That, and then aging in the fourth age, right? This is when you're old, old. And even before that, the, the third age, right? When you are still more robust, we'll talk about going into the second age a little later, but well, going in today is, is this whole period here of, of transitioning from the second age, adulthood, to the third age that is uh, quote unquote older adulthood, the third age. So what does it mean to transition to be adult to an older adult? And here's a little video about that from College Humor. You know what I read the other day? Hmm. Eminem is fucking 41. What? Yep. No, he's not. Yeah. No, he's not. Dude, no, it's true. And his daughter, Haley, 18. I feel so old. Lately, it's like I turn on the TV and all the athletes and pop stars are younger than me. Yeah, Blake Griffin is 25. 
I'm 26. We're so old. I would say going to the bathroom is my greatest struggle. We are closer in age to Homer Simpson than we are Bart Simpson. I read on BuzzFeed that if Bart Simpson were a human, he'd be 37 years old. We are so old. We're so old. I thought about my dead husband today and realized I could no longer clearly picture his face. Do you guys realize we've been out of college almost as long as we were in college? I want to get a dog to be less lonely, but I think I'd die first and then he'd be lonely. Aubrey is going to be a mom. She's our age, and she's going to be a mom. Papa, you ready for church? I'm not your father. Sorry. I have dementia. Ever since I started working full-time two weeks ago, I automatically wake up earlier on the weekends. It's like my body knows. It knows. I can't sleep at night because all my bones hurt and my regrets. Yesterday, while I was fucking my girlfriend, she found a gray chest hair. <laughs> Well, there goes the last of the molars. When I smile now, I have, like, lines. Like, oh, This is normal now. Nintendo 64 came out 18 years ago. You're fucking lying. I used to have 33 cousins. Now I have no cousins. The Chuck E. Cheese mouse is different now. Different how? It's skinny. Kids born in 2000 are teenagers now. No, no, I won't. I don't, I don't teenagers. believe Teenagers. No, mm -mm. Oh. I'm going to be sick. Well, at least we're not fucking idiots. We're so old! <laughs> That's So being older is subjective potentially because you've seen those young kids thinking that they are old. So you see that in the state of mind, what is old, it's really relative. It's mid-age. So life expectancy is low, low 80s for men and for women, it's in the mid-80s then mid-age, it's in its 40s. Here's a graph here. So when does one cross over from middle to old age? And we see here that, that it becomes an inflection point, right? This inflection point of when does one become old, right? And, and then because this growing pattern starts to decline, right? And you start to see more declines and less growth. And you could all you also see the same thing over here that it starts to become a, an inflection point. Take a life course perspective because this is not just uh, an event when somebody becomes quote unquote older. It's actually it's a process. We know that it's a whole process. Right? That's why we take this whole life course perspective about it and this these these middle this middle adulthood to older adulthood it's kind of these forgotten years because there's just so much going on with responsibilities when we talk about midlife the the midlife in the u.s study the midas study is one of the the standards of of uh, what we know in midlife what we learned about the Paradox of aging really high, is highlighted from the Midas study. You see here that as cognitive and physical health doo -doo 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 -doo, starts to decline, right? We would expect uh, life satisfaction to decline, but it doesn't. It actually maintains and even rises. And you see this point here, right? This is actually doo -doo -doo, in you see, in midlife, in midlife, there, there starts to be this qualitative shift and change. And we learned that from the Midas study. And this Midas study has been going on since 1994. It has over 7,000 uh, participants in the U.S. And it actually is being replicated in other areas such as uh, Japan as well because they have a large aging population uh, they recruit participants through these random digit dialing. So I guess they were like the first robo callers, you could say. And we know that what happens to you later in life is, is a product of what happens to you, uh, your experiences and what happens to you prior to life. And we know a lot about early life, but we don't know about this midlife in between points, so hence why this Midas study was created as well. Because we know that development doesn't just stop at 18, which they used to think, 
you know, it, it doesn't stop at 59. You know, it, it continues throughout the life course. And we know that age just itself is not a great indicator of uh, outcome because there are other factors such as health factors, wealth factors, role factors involved. When we, and then especially in midlife, right, you're also wearing a lot of hats. You know, there's a lot of like responsibilities coming at you during this period in this Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. And kind of, this was one of the first seminal theories to highlight that development just doesn't stop in adulthood, right? It, it extends to throughout the life course. Development happens throughout life. And what happens earlier really uh, impacts uh, later life outcomes. And for issues with development in midlife, it's all about generativity versus stagnation. And when we talk about generativity, it's about contributing to the world, right? Whether you have made your mark on the, the next generation, did you make a mark in the world? That's generativity, right? Did you leave this life legacy? Did, and leaving this life legacy is not just about for your children, because that's, that's usually associated with that, but it also could be in the workplace, in the world, or just in your relationships. And then on the other part of the spectrum, there's this stagnation piece, right? This is when you are really more inward, so you really haven't contributed to society, but you're just you're just feeling stuck, you know. You and feeling this stuckness is part of where I guess the the midlife crises whole uh, debate has come in because it's like, oh, you're you're just you don't feel like you contributed to the world. You don't and you haven't done anything worth living for, and you haven't accomplished that much. So that's kind of the, the, the stagnation piece of it. But we know this is epigenetic, meaning that it's, meaning like you interact, your feelings of generativity and stagnation really uh, depend on the environment you're in, and you could change that, right? This is something that is plastic. And so it's never too late to change in the life course. So going back to like why people feel maybe generative or, or stagnated, it's you're just juggling so much during this period of life, right? A lot of responsibilities of work, a lot of responsibilities of child rearing. And nowadays, because people are living longer than ever, this, this added responsibility of taking care of your parents, right? Hence why the sandwich generation. Sandwich generation are these intergenerational responsibilities. Think of taking care of your kids and then also taking care of your parents as well at the same time. Hence why the sandwichness of that. You have two responsibilities, you know, on different parts of the spectrum. That means about one in eight Americans are in this sandwich situation. Being in this sandwich situation is stressful, right? Because it's not just about taking care of your children, which you have a responsibility for, but you also have this obligated responsibility for your, your parents, right? Who have taken care of you. And there's this, there, there's so much, uh, I guess, burden, right? That, that comes from this dual this intergenerational caregiving that we're starting to learn now that it starts to take their toll on these people that are in the sandwich generation, right? And there's work coming out now that, that being a caregiver, well, it's over me, <laughs> that being a caregiver, that being a caregiver is also related, that negatively impacts your own health, especially if you are burnt out or, or, these, or these responsibilities are really taking over. Uh, you feel like you're, these responsibilities are really taking over your life. So bringing it back to the theory of psychosocial development, you could see here that because there's just so much responsibilities out there, right, to take care of people, th there doesn't seem to be enough time during the day. When there's not enough time during the day, you stop to, you start 
to lose sight of what you want to contribute to the world, and then you're just like, by the time that you become、uh, older adult, it's like, oh wow, what did I accomplish, right? And this is where this the stagnation comes in, right?、And、this is a very psychological thing about, hey, have you contributed enough to society? And the stagnation is really the the focal point of what people have. Term this midlife crisis, right? And it just because time just flies by, right? And this, and then all of a sudden you're just like, whoa, what have I accomplished? Have I given enough to society? This stagnation is really what is the highlight of, like I said, this midlife crisis, right? And this is a typical picture, right? You that we hear these stories of people in going through a midlife crisis who start to ditch their life that they've built and trying to start a whole new life, but it's not age appropriate. Like this guy、uh, with his white tight pants and his new Corvette. So a lot of this stagnation has to do with fear, right? Fear of that they have not contributed, right? They have not moved the needle in the world how they wanted to. It's about aging. It's about accomplishments, and it's also about like whether they have this felt significance. You know, this is like what we've determined like their meaning in life, right? The satisfaction. There is research though to suggest that most people don't go through a midlife crisis. Only about ten to twenty percent of people actually quote unquote go through a crisis during midlife. In actuality. Those people who have gone through、uh, a crisis and it just happens to be in midlife went through crises prior to that.、Uh, we'll get to this "quote unquote" quarter life crises, right? People are more likely to experience a midlife crisis if they've gone through a quarter life crisis. So think about crises as a life course thing, right? If you're more, if you're likely to go through a crisis like. Let's just say, as a teenager, you're likely to go to one as when you're in emerging adults. Then, then you're more likely to go through one when you're in midlife as well. So, what are the characteristics related to whether you go through crises or not?、Uh, some of the research points to、uh, maybe dispositionally, like a neuroticism、uh, personality. So, this is neuroticism. Essentially, is when.、Uh, There's this disposition of patterns of behavior being worried or, or nervous, or there might be a lack of、uh, adaptability, right? Being able to cope well during adversity and stressful times. And we know we have a lot of those. <laughs> you could think of people who are friends that they something goes wrong, and for them it's pouring outside, right? It's it's. It's it's like the worst thing in the world, and they can't really adapt to stressors as well. So is it that? So we have to look through patterns, right? That's why the life course perspective is so powerful because we see patterns in people. You know, just so this is one of the reasons why midlife doesn't midlife crises is not necessarily a thing. Dominantly suggests that midlife. Is just、uh, happens to be a period where some people go through crises that went through crises earlier in life, and、uh, research also debunks that it's mostly men that go through these crises. Women are likely to go through them as well, right? It really depends on whether they went through a crises earlier in the lifespan, because even if they're going to go through a crises in midlife. Later in life, they're more likely also to go through a crisis. So there, there's just, there's just, I guess, there's not a crisis.、Uh, I guess there is like a crisis correlation in the, according to the the literature. When I saw this on Doctor Phil, that that this is like the prototypical example of somebody, a male version of going through the, a crisis in midlife. Born. My husband Tony is going through a midlife crisis. I don't think I'm having a midlife crisis. I'm just trying to find my purpose in life. Tony told me that he didn't want to be married anymore, but we just had a phenomenal marriage. I feel like I've been duped. I didn't want that label of being married. 
and he started to change his behavior. Tony started to worry about his appearance a lot more. He wanted to lose weight. He got his teeth whitened. They talked about things like liposuction. I don't think there's any reason why he shouldn't try and take pride in my appearance and look good. I wanted to buy a, a new Harley Davidson. If I want to buy a shiny toy for myself, I think I deserve it. So I would like to take piano lessons. Why shouldn't I be able to do young, fun things? He was wearing his wedding ring on his other hand. And when I asked him about it, he was like, it bothers my hand sometimes. Tony retired, and he got a private security job at a local casino. Tony made it pretty clear that he did not want me around the casino. I like positive attention from females. I flirt. I started to wonder if he was having an affair. He joined Facebook. Tony was becoming friends with a lot of women on Facebook. I'm not actively looking for anyone else. I want that option. The very next day, he said, I want a divorce. When the divorce is final, I will have more freedom to do what I want to do. You like being with me, don't you? I don't like dealing with the pressure. I do love Jill. I don't want her out of my life. I just want to take care of me right now. I need to take care of Tony. I want to shake him and say, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, that that is like a, a prime example that we stereotypically think as like some a male going through a midlife crisis. You know, it's like, oh, wait, well, I want more attention. You know, he said he wants to buy Harley Davidson. <laughs> he, he was changing his appearance. And you could see likely this this maybe this marriage wasn't going the way he wanted to or it's it's hard to tell obviously this is sensationalized for tv but that's like the prototypical one and it seemed like uh, a lot of the a lot of the triggers of that it are these life events that happen you know when you retire right it's, it's it becomes a potential trigger especially him he seems young uh in terms of in midlife so Hence, wanted to get more fit, wanted to, to do all these other factors and things for his health and ditching his wife. <laughs> so, so here's the uh, prototypical example from the female's perspective. My husband, Miles, believes I'm going through a midlife crisis. Turning 50 has really been very scary for me. Her actions are somebody seeking excitement that a 20-year-old would want. I'm full of energy, I'm full of life, and I'm bored. I want more out of life. I'm from the big city, and I enjoy socializing. I'm not content just living in a small town. I've never wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. I want a career. I need more excitement. With her 50th birthday come and gone, she is very panicky about achieving goals and more focused on youthful adult activities. Miles just doesn't have a sparkle. Miles is very boring. I had an affair. Miles believes that that was the beginning of my midlife crisis. My gentleman friend made me feel alive again. I lived with my gentleman friend for close to a year. I was devastated. Miles was threatening to take my children away from me, so I had no choice. I had to move back in with Miles. She feels like a trapped animal, pacing around. That's what it's like to live with her. I haven't kissed Miles in over four years. Sex can happen, <laughs> but there's just no intimacy. I'm not in love with Miles. I don't know if I ever have been in love with him. I know, scandalous, wow. So you could see uh, the commonalities between Tony's uh, experience and her experience, forgot her name, uh, because of like, there, there's these major life events that happen, right? They, these act as quote unquote triggers. These life events that trigger them start to, they start to think down this path like, oh, this is not the life that I wanted to live. Likewise, we see that in midlife that child rearing is really related to marital satisfaction as well. You could see on this graph here that when people get married, right, and without kids, you start to see, dang, I'm so off right now, but right, you can see right here that that satisfaction, marital satisfaction is relatively high. But then as 
child rearing happens, right, and you start to have young kids, it starts to decrease and decrease. And then over, you start to see here during this teenage area, right, wow, it starts to get at its lowest. And then when they, when they start, the nest starts to empty, you start to see marital satisfaction generally go up and up, right? This is, this, this really aligns with like being able to focus more on themselves because they're so struggling so much roles during this midlife process. However, we see nowadays that, that, and we'll talk a little bit about it in emerging adulthood, that the parents usually have to reaccommodate their children because of multiple factors. We'll get into this more in an emerging adulthood, that the child actually enters back into the fold of uh, the parents lives into their house so we'll get a little to that more and that will affect marital status so much of midlife is also spent juggling work responsibilities and as you we see here from the bureau of labor statistics uh, time use survey most of the waking day is spent uh at work or work related activities 8.7 hours and you can see here though in midlife you start to go beyond uh you start to go to this maintenance period of work right you start to know what you're doing as opposed to earlier when you're in your early career you don't really uh you start you you in this in this early part of your career you start to you're forming your skills right you're seeing what you're good at you're seeing where you fit but during midlife there's this more cruising stage right and that's potential explanation of why uh, we start to see happiness starting to go up as well when we highlight uh, the biological processes that that change in midlife right we see that these declines in physical health, even though there's some steadiness in uh, life satisfaction, a lot of this has to deal, especially for men, we talk, there's a lot of work that goes along with changes in testosterone levels, right? Just biologically, there's just changes in um, energy levels related to hormonal changes, right? And, and in muscle mass. This is actually a doctor uh, I forgot his name, but he he he's one of the people who are the faces of like what's called like T, right? Like T T therapy, meaning testosterone therapy. You can see Frank Thomas is another one, right? The new genics, right? That's the, the other anti-aging thing because we start to see this dip in midlife of uh, testosterone, but there's. Uh, it, it, there's like supplements now that are used to increase energy. Also risk involved with engaging in these artificial testosterone therapies. One of them being uh, these increased risks of uh, experiencing stroke or cardiovascular uh, infarcts or heart attacks. Um, there's also damages that, show, that have been suggested to the prostate glands as well. And Beyond the testosterone, there's also uh, cosmetic changes that happen in the middle, in midlife, such as graying or balding. We see here, and you know, there's many of those commercials of oh, fixing baldness or or dyeing your hair. So these are biological changes that happen in midlife that are associated with aging. So for females, it's also highlighted that there are biological changes, and one of the one of the hallmarks of this is like menopause, right? When uh, women stop becoming fertile, right, and they stop releasing eggs, and this is associated with the hormonal changes and biological changes, hot flashes, sleepless nights, and and uh, mood changes. Definitely a decrease in uh, estrogen, right? There are decreases in estrogen levels that are associated with all of uh, these symptoms, and they, there's uh, estrogen therapy that's going on, but these have shown mixed results. And we know that what happens to people in older adulthood is really 
really antecedent to midlife. Because midlife is this point of inflection, this point of change, right? And it's marked by many uh, psychological needs of dealing with the aging process. Uh, especially these needs of generativity, right? Feeling if you contributed enough to the world. With stagnation, right? It's like, oh man, am I doing what I'm doing? What do I want to be doing in life? And it's at this intersection we see a lot of these changes in, in health, knowledge, and resources. Because if you think about it, in midlife, this is when you start to become established with everything. And uh, this is probably one of the reasons why we see this peak. Uh, we start to see this increase in uh, subjective well-being, happiness levels. But we also see the, that these midlife crises, right, that happen in midlife aren't necessarily uh, widespread. Not everybody goes through them, right? Uh, it's only 10 to 20 percent. And most of this is just people who are, who have gone through a crisis earlier in life are more likely just to go through crises in midlife. So it's more about going through a crisis in, that happens to be in midlife that then, than the, than a parent like midlife crises that happens and a lot of these midlife crises are triggered through these major life events and, and biological changes as well this is just a natural part of the aging process that occurs and these biological things especially uh, hormonally relate to uh, the aging process of transitioning from adulthood to older adulthood and psychological, and psychological process of what it means to get old. And uh, this mid-adulthood is this period, this, this period right before one becomes an older adult that's really dictates what happens in older adulthood. Thank you for watching this video on middle to old adulthood, bridge period between when one becomes an adult to older adult. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the video and you got something out of it. So uh, as always, Denata, and I will see you next time. Here we go. Extra, extra, read all about it. Queen coming back with a brand new style. Been focused on my shit, making moves in silence. Working out, sleeping in.